Let's get started. My name is Horton Beebe Center. I'm President Emeritus of Eurasia Foundation, which for the past 25 years has been working with businesses, governments, and civic organizations uh, to promote prosperity and stability in the nations of Eurasia. I'm also on the governing board of the Kiev School of Economics and uh, pleased to be a member of the advisory board of Stratage East. The, uh, the title of this panel is Building the New Economy in Eurasia. Now you might ask, haven't we been doing just that for the past 25 years? Uh, well, of course, uh, but uh, at least part of that time we were unbuilding the old economy. And even as the elements of what replaced the old economy were being assembled, the fundamental nature of how the economy functions has evolved. Last night we heard from Prasanna that the new economy, the data economy, resides at the convergence of manufacturing services and technologies that produce value-added, technology-enabled, and rapidly adapting industries. Our purpose this morning is to get a glimpse from our panelists of how these various elements of the new economy are understood and practiced here in this country, throughout the region, and indeed around the world. And then to accept Anatoly's challenge of last night when he said, IT is in the title of this event, but the forum is really about policy and what we can do in the next year to help steer the policies that relate to this sphere in the right direction. So our task is to identify the links between what practitioners are doing in the new economy and the policies that are emerging or need to be shaped for the optimum benefit of all of us who are living in the new economy. Now we're fortunate to have a distinguished panel of entrepreneurs, policymakers, economists, and industry pioneers to guide us in this discussion. We have, starting from the far left, Alexander Bornyakov. He is Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine and a founder of several IT companies. We have Dmitro Shalomko, Director of Google Ukraine, and he's been with the country since, company since its entry into Ukraine, since before its entry into Ukraine, <laughs> before the beginning. Uh, Arkady Dobkin, the founder and president of EPAM, among the, leading, the world's leading software and product engineering services companies. Dimitar Bagov, regional lead economist for Eastern Europe and the Caucasus at EBRD, and former chair of the Central Bank of Macedonia. And Martin Bailey, an international legal specialist and head of the Unit for Policy Development and Coordination in the Directorate General for Communications, Networks, Content, and Technology at the European Commission, for short, DG Connect. Each panelist will make an opening statement of up to 10 minutes, followed by discussion and questions from the audience, provided we have time. So I'd like to invite Alex to take the floor. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks for for the honor of being here and uh, to present our ministry and our vision on, uh, on, on, those, on those matters. So, um, well, that's the, well, first of all, that's a great sign uh, that in this, in this specific government, uh, there was a decision to make uh, digital transformation as a separate ministry because uh, that's the sign that uh, people who run this country understand importance of uh, switching to uh, uh, industry 4.0.0 uh, and, uh, and all the matters related to uh, interactions between uh, citizens and government. So the major task of the ministry, of, of course, is, is to make all these uh, services available online. So um, I would say this is like 60% of the, of the ministry job 
is, is to move everything online. But um, I often say when, I, uh, when people invite me to talk about ministry that uh, this is not just about moving everything that people get used to do uh, in the paper form uh, to online forms. It's also about refactoring the government procedures and interactions between government and citizen to make it easier, to make it really transparent and just like one click or just a couple, couple uh, fields to fill out and then and get response. And um, one of the goals of the ministry, like a major goal, is to move 100% services online and specifically 20% of them to be completely automatic. Because you know, like I even even though you go online and uh, and enter all these fields and, and set up the forms and you want to, or in, in case you want to open a business or, or get some support, still on the uh, uh, on the back end, there's there's a, some guy who make a decision and check check this data, but um, uh, often we can do that completely automatically. So we uh, we do a lot of efforts, make a lot of efforts to uh, to move it online. Um, Besides that, there, there, there are three other uh, priorities for the ministry. So second is to make 100% territory of Ukraine territory available, uh, um, broadband, broadband internet available on 100% territory. Um, uh, apparently, I just came from the States, so I apologize for, for mess up thoughts sometimes because <laughs> I, I still jet lagged. So, it's, I, so, um, so <laughs> yeah, um, anyway, so... 100% uh, broad, uh, online uh, broadband connection. Uh, then we uh, w well we can't have digital government if people of Ukraine uh, don't know how to use it. I mean, if they're afraid of uh, using uh, use online for form of interaction, or they don't have smartphones, or they don't know, don't know how to use the smartphones. So another priority is to teach six million people uh, basic uh, digital skills uh, and. Uh, and uh, which I'm in charge of is support uh, and develop IT industry and all the specific things related to IT industry. So uh, talking about my priority, uh, my goal specifically is to uh, make a uh, high-tech expert and uh, IT share in GDP up to 10%. So now it's like close to 5%. And we want to increase, we want to double it and make uh, IT uh, share in Ukrainian GDP, as I mentioned before, 10%. So this is, th this is, this is really huge. And, and I, can, I can definitely break it down. So first of all, we need to set up, uh, and it's about policy. Because uh, right now, um, from the legislation point of view, uh, we have, we don't have much of IT companies in Ukraine. We have brands that hire uh, individual entrepreneurs. And this is a big deal. And I know Arkady can support me here. So, especially for, for public companies. Yeah, so we, we can talk about this later, definitely. So, so right now, um, we work with the um, IT Association of Ukraine with their, all these companies, uh, besides the associations that, that take part in, in this industry to, uh, to, to agree on a framework on how this industry could be taxed and how it could be formed from legislation point of view. Um, so, so this is the first thing. Another thing is what I'm fo personally focused on is, uh, uh, m uh, is startup and venture uh, capital uh, ecosystem, I would say. So this is my another priority. So we, we're going to do a lot of things to support this and uh, make it grow. And, uh, the, and another one, maybe last but not least, is, is, is everything is related to cryptocurrencies. We're now working on legislation fr framework and, and, again, a policy about make it, uh, making it, uh, make it work in Ukraine. So... Um, so that's, that's three major things. But besides that, uh, th there are a lot of things with, that we, we do also to uh, enable um, specific, specific things from, from 4.0 industry, which is like um, robotics, VR and R, uh, 3D printing, and, um, and many other things. So 
we're going to definitely support this by our, our ministry. Um, I don't know. This is, this is just a brief. I don't know if I've taken 10 minutes or not. Uh, no, you haven't. Oh, I haven't. So I was brief. Uh, whatever. But well, you can stop at any point. You've yeah, raised yeah. a lot of issues <laughs> yeah. already. Well, like, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of covered everything that we do now. Um, and uh, maybe I missed something. But, well, also GDPR, which, which we discussed before. So this is also a matter related to the policies that we... Uh, well, basically, we take a lot of efforts to harmonize uh, our laws with the European Union, uni, uh, union laws. And uh, well, not just European unions, but also, for, for instance, it's anti-money -money laundering uh, provisions and BEPS provisions, because financial transparency is also very important. Um, well, I, I just recap what I missed. <laughs> so sure. uh, another important issue that I'm taking care of is synchronizing um, IT, um, I would say worldwide IT infrastructure with Ukrainian IT infrastructure. What I mean here is uh, that some of their well-known services, which work on, on the most of uh, developed countries like PayPal, doesn't work in Ukraine. So we're working uh, on this matter to bring it here, but not just PayPal because th there's a couple other things that doesn't work here uh, for in e-commerce, e not just in finance, but also in, in different fields. And, uh, and creative eco economics, uh, from my perspective, uh, which I'm a believer is also part of uh, 4.0 industry, is uh, we can't work with, without it. So basically, if Ukrainian citizen can have an account on Etsy or on Amazon or eBay, because they, the payment matter is PayPal, which is also, which, which is everything related. It's, we we missed a lot of opportunities, so this is this is also our point, and we taking care of the trying to take care take care of this. Well, I think I'm going to stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, thank you very much. Uh, the, you've uh, you've brought up a number of issues that I I think that will generate good discussion among the group, and I, I saw Arkady respond to one thing you said. Uh, about uh, the idea that as you scale up, as you seek to scale up to double the share in Ukraine's uh, GDP from 5 to 10 percent, uh, that the, mo the business model has to go beyond uh, the serial hiring of uh, independent consultants. And I, and I hope that, uh, Arkady, you'll uh, provide a, uh, a rebuttal even to that if you see the market in a different way. Um, uh, and uh, the, anyway, the, uh, your, your mention, Alex, that uh, the mere establishment of the ministry sends a very powerful signal um, is, uh, is an excellent point. And many of the uh, elements that you described, whether it's um, uh, moving things online, uh, moving uh, government functions online, to do more than just get rid of the paper, that citizens have to deal with, but to facilitate a better relationship between the government and citizens. Um, whether you, uh, we take your uh, goal of 100% broadband coverage or synchronizing IT infrastructures so that government and business and every citizen of Ukraine can have access, equal access, and overcome the thresholds that naturally exist. The broader policy here that, that comes to mind um, is what do you do about those who are left out? Um, what does business do in order to broaden its client base and its partner base? What does government do to reduce those thresholds uh, so that we can, uh, so that it can reach these very ambitious targets? And I'm going to ask the panel to think about that, uh, but now move on to Dimitro uh, Sholomko uh, to give us his introduction. Thanks very much, Alex. Dimitro. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, hello everyone, I'm Dmitro, I'm running Google. I think I have a couple of slides if we can switch them on right now because, well, uh, I can talk a little bit about um, things. Uh, yeah, I just don't know what I see, I don't, don't see anything uh, Usually Google likes to talk about ourselves, but uh, this time I don't want to do it. Um, uh, that's, many of you know what Google does, many, know, many of you know how, actually, how Google is operational here. Well, in any, every country, there is no big deal, big difference between, between Google here and Google everywhere. Uh, another thing that actually may be more interesting for, for, for you is um, 
the fact that we have a lot of data, of course, right? So <laughs> Google knows many things we share. Sometimes we don't. This time I wanted to share with you a couple of numbers, mostly benchmarks, about the state of uh, the region. I'm not talking about Eurasia. I'm talking about Central and Eastern Europe. It's a little bit different focus, but well, for me, Eurasia and the, and the, and the region I am responsible for, besides Ukraine, are all former countries, Soviet Union countries except Russia. So um, if you're talking about it in particular, um, I wouldn't say there are much things going on, many things going on outside of Ukraine and Belarus and Baltics in this situation. So I don't have numbers for Caucasus countries, I don't have numbers for, for Central Asia yet, but I have a little bit interesting numbers for for Baltics, Belarus, and, and Ukraine, which actually shows interesting trends and interesting benchmarks of how the market is, de is developing. So let me start showing you some numbers. I must uh, apologize. I have one big mistake on one slide. I will show you later. Here? No. Here. Here. It worked. One second. Here? Mm -hmm. no. No, 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 no. Okay. So... No, okay. So this is it. So uh, first number I wanted to show you is actual number of developers, a number of developers per um, 100 people of, uh, of workforce, available workforce. So the, the mistake I'm, I'm openly saying about mistakes, a mistake is for Ukraine it's not 0 0.1, it's 0 0.7 actually. It's not changing the place of Ukraine in this list, it's still last from this benchmark, but it's a little bit more significant. So what I wanted to show you here is actually you can see that uh, most of Central Asian most of Central Europe's countries are big development powerhouses, and uh, I wanted to turn your attention to position of Poland, because Poland has a huge number of, uh, of developers, a huge one. Poland has uh, just leapfrogged recently. I would say it took them maybe 20 years to do it, but Poland is probably number one country in terms of IT development right now in Central and Eastern Europe, and they do whatever possible. So you can see Ukraine is number two here. Um, but if you're talking about number of developers per workforce, the first place is pretty much, um, so, uh, let's say, uh, surprising many people. Slovakia. What, what the hell is going on in Slovakia? Um, I don't know. Anyone from Slovakia or knows why Slovakia has big penetration of developers? No? Uh, it's pretty much simple. This is something that I wanted to explain. Every country in Europe has the uh, speci specialization, speciality. There are ecosystems built around specific product or specific topic. And for Slovakia, it's actually antivirus and protection. Two out of five, I think, biggest uh, antivirus companies in the world are from Slovakia, honestly speaking. Um, and uh, for many countries, it's different specialization. For example, Belarus, which is very important IT market with a big ecosystem, it has very interesting specialization. In, in terms of product development, most biggest companies that do products, IT products in Belarus are gaming companies. Many people know Wargaming. Wargaming was probably the big, first and biggest one. But there are tens, maybe even up to 100 companies that do gaming. And a lot of uh, big games uh, that probably you or your family plays or kids playing on mobile phones are made and been done in Belarus. I can give you a simple example. There's a company called Playrix, which is officially Russian. And uh, I think they're based in Dublin right now officially. But uh, home country, hometown is Vologda in Russia. I think the biggest development center for Play Playrix, which is Gardenscape's game, the guy with mustache who fixes his house, is actually be being done in Minsk, honestly. So there are many examples like this. Ukraine, under the same situation, Ukraine doesn't have speciality yet. Ukraine, well, if you will say that outsourcing speciality is a little bit wrong. Yes, Ukraine is outsourcing powerhouse, but not really product powerhouse yet. Ukraine doesn't have speciality. And Ukraine actually has a big gap with other countries, which actually gives a lot of opportunities. So when I hear 5% uh, GDP going to 10% GDP, the, we have a lot of headroom to do it, honestly speaking. We have so many resources and so many opportunities because Ukraine is not developed here. So I would say maybe your, your, your goal to make 10 is not ambitious enough. You can do it a little bit better. So next slide I wanted to show, we, we can do a little bit better. You will do whatever you need, but Ukraine actually can do better. Next thing, next slide I wanted to show. Oh, sorry, it's I probably pressing something wrong. Okay, so this one is actually it's a venture funding per country. Again, Ukraine is in the last place here. Um, number one is I'm showing here Israel as the number one, and second is Ireland. It's very simple. It's uh, just for benchmark. It's the two biggest uh, EMEA countries in terms of finance. Ireland is famous for its tax regime, which is actually going to change next year. Israel is just a startup nation. Everyone knows it. That actually, a lot of companies are being generated there. And uh, here, 
A couple of countries like Estonia has very high, very high, high rate. Estonia is only one country from former Soviet Union that is officially treated uh, in the world as digitally mature market. This is actually a country that, actually, that, that is much more developed than most of countries even in the European Union. One of the top countries and an excellent example of how things around it should be done. Um, other countries are actually still lagging behind, but Ukraine is specifically lagging behind, and I think this is actually where, where policymakers, where government should really take, take, take care of, maybe not really, um, uh, like change something, right? There are many points that government can change, a lot of things that uh, can be applied and restructured, but for me it's a very simple example. This, this, this ecosystem in its state lacks funding, strongly lacks funding. If we are talking about, if we are talking about progress and development of this industry, uh, some, something should be done to attract funding in this country. There are many reasons for this. It's war, it's economical uncertainty, it's corruption as many people know. Still, I think this gap is too wide. This gap is too big and this, uh, this, uh, this can be fixed. At the same time, actually, if we are going forward with the situation here, this is a couple of examples from our region that are can be considered as unicorns or officially are uni unicorns. Unicorn is a company which valuation is over $1 billion, if, if uh, someone doesn't know this term. So the first one was Skype. And Skype is originally Estonian. So uh, to, to, it was, I think, two people who built Skype. They sold it for, I don't remember actually which amount of money to Microsoft. Which, uh, and they actually built, they used this money for develop or develop several projects around in Estonia. One project is actually brewery, which is very, very interesting. <laughs> they invested in brewery, beer making. But at the same time, they did many projects around, around IT, outsourcing, uh, artificial intelligence, and several pro companies actually were born after Skype acquisition. And Estonia, uh, Skype was the very first company, and, uh, and uh, it fueled development of Estonia. Another example I have here is TransferWise, which is also an Estonian company, and partially is still coming from Skype acquisition. So this is these, these people who were connected to Skype, they built TransferWise, and TransferWise quickly became next unicorn. It's a banking, it's fintech startup, well, it's not startup anymore. It's just a very big, big international, uh, international payment solution right now that, that is much cheaper than just, just banking thing, and they're challenging uh, swift dominance on the market right now. Uh, I'm showing here War Gaming, which is actually a Belarusian company, very famous one. Uh, it's not a public company, so there is no valuation for this company, but if you will just uh, find out the revenues, you can easily assume they're big one, bigger than $1 billion. And uh, the last, uh, the last uh, example I'm giving him is a company called Grammarly, which is original Ukrainian, now based in San Francisco, keeping here marketing and all developments. And recently they just um, received another round of funding, which put their valuation at $1.2 billion right now. So it's, I would say, probably officially first unicorn from Ukraine, which is a big deal for Ukraine. It's a product company. It's artificial intelligence grammar check company that helps to uh, improve your languages. Uh, it's not only English, it's actually they do a lot of things. So you can see that this, this, this market, these countries can generate big companies, big unicorns, big product companies. And um, for me, um, I think that it just can be done. It's, it's pretty much comparing to other countries I work with. It's easy. It's a greenfield opportunity. Well, maybe except Estonia because it's developed. But for other countries, it's pretty much greenfield opportunity to go ahead and build, uh, and, and build solutions, use the workforce that is existing to achieve great success worldwide. That's it. That is what I wanted to say. This is what I wanted to show you for now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mitra. The, uh, Providing uh, these statistics and a sense of uh, how Ukraine fits into the broader, uh, the broader region with respect to the IT sector um, gives us a very helpful framing for our discussion. And the two points that you, uh, that you made about specialization and capitalization. In, in the case of the latter, you specifically have uh, referred to policy as being, uh, as being uh, essential to increasing the, or crossing this gap, bridging this gap of uh, lack of access to capital to promote the growth of this IT sector. With regard to specialization, I'd like to come back to that later and see whether, is there any policy dimension to the fact that in Belarus it's uh, gaming largely, Slovakia it's uh, largely antivirus, or are these idi idiosyncratic uh, uh, dimensions to the development of IT. Um, but what would be uh, a policy um, response to that? 
um, uh, if we're looking at trying to achieve the levels of growth here in Ukraine and elsewhere uh, that uh, Alex has mentioned. Now we'll go to Arkady um, for, uh, to hear about uh, EPAM. Thank you. Uh, I also have some slides and I think, uh, I don't know if I am supposed to be sitting on previous panel or this panel, but uh, I think I'll, I'll try to share the story which probably would be uh, applicable to the previous conversation and this is when, and argue a little bit about numbers, uh, even if it's coming from Google. Uh, so uh, let me talk about IPAM, which is, uh, I don't know, like uh, when I'm meeting people, usually I'm told that it's a Belarusian company. Once I was flying in the, from New York and the person saw my back and said, oh, you're working for this Ukrainian company. So, and uh, let me give you a couple slides about who we are and where we are like. We started in 93 actually in the United States and simultaneously opened office in Minsk, Belarus. And last year our revenue was 1.8 billion. This year will be close to 2.3 billion. Uh, we growing for 34 quarters, at least 20% organically. And while we were not on the list of before we practically close to 10 billion in market cap. So we have about over 30,000 engineers, over 34,000 people globally right now. Uh, clients, 50% of our clients is Forbes 2000. So we're working for large enterprises. Google actually uh, one of our top clients and um, we're working for them for almost 12 years. The same like for many other companies. And here, this is unfortunately projector. This slide should look like very differently. But you can see the bottom of this. We're working for, and we're working for the last 20 plus years for software companies with Oracle, SAP, and they actually help us to build very engineering culture. And it was startups in different industries. And then about 10 years ago, we started to work for Googles and Expedia, and now working in for Apple and for Uber and for all this uh, digitally born company and learn from them a lot, but also sharing a lot of knowledge which we accumulated in software engineering. And six, seven years ago, we started to work for more traditional corporations. And we're actually helping to compete with uh, Amazons and Facebooks and Googles of the world from one point of view, utilizing the some accelerators which come in from traditional software vendors. So we're probably one of the few relatively large companies globally which understand all these aspects of software engineering and technology consultancy. So this is where we are today. And on top of this, we have an interesting ecosystem of people. 34,000 people total headcount with 80% in Central Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union. With uh, 30 countries in general, oops. Okay, sorry, I'm going awkward. Oops, I wanted to show this. <laughs> ah. Okay, I wanted to show this. In result, we have uh, 90 delivery centers across the globe today. 10,000 people in Belarus, 8,000 people in Ukraine, 6,000 across Russia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Uzbekistan, 4,000 in Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Czech Republic. So first of all, we know the market very, very well. And that's why like in Belarus with 40,000 total people, 25% just to pump. 
and wargaming about 1,500 people with big development offices in Russia, in Ukraine. And as all of us, like when we say in Ukrainian company, Belarusian companies, unfortunately, we all need to understand that all of us, U.S. companies or Cyprus company or something else company. And that's the reality of the globe right now. Companies trying to be headquartered where the market is. And it's a little bit naive thinking that headquarters will start happen here until the market will start happen here. And I think it's a topic of this conversation actually how companies can change the ecosystem. And from this point of view, I wanted to kind of share that from this point of view, we consider it ourselves practically as an ecosystem company with this number of people and with the story how we get here. Uh, so basically about 25,000 people we have in the region. And we started 25 years ago in a bedroom of the small apartment in New Jersey and basement of this apartment building in Minsk. And then we, 15 years ago, enjoyed to see the first Gartner report which put it some Eastern European companies on the map, and you can see a bunch of them there. And we were joking internally in 2003 that we would like to jump from this place to where Accenture and Deloitte and Sapient exist. And at this point, IPAM has about 500 people, mostly in Belarus, a little bit in the US. It was only two countries at this time, and we just kind of acquired company in Hungary. And we understand that we have multiple challenges to actually compete globally, and that was a dream. And it was educational challenge, it was legislative challenge, and it was perception challenge. Not enough people were coming from universities. Universities were in pretty bad shape. Uh, Local law didn't allow to work transparently to pay salaries as you have to. And perception was that who hell will work in Belarus or Ukraine and why we need like, to give work them because we are so much advanced in US or Western Europe. And at this point, we decided to fight those challenges and actually to do IPO on a major stock exchange. Uh, when we announced it, to our people then for the next eight years, each town hall, I had a joke, when it's going to happen. So, but in 2004, we started internal and external educational activities because we understand that nobody will help but ourselves. In 2005, we initiated the process by putting a concept draft together to change legislation in Belarus to support IT industry and to give it a chance to compete globally. And in 2006, to our surprise, Belarusian government actually embraced the idea and with help with a couple of people like Zipkal and Misnikovic, they allow and bring it to the highest level in the country to Lukashenko, approve the new concept. And by the way, on previous uh, panel, people were talking about Belarusian park, that it's a territory. That's actually was the main uh, advantage that was probably one of the first or probably first high-tech park in Eastern Europe, which wasn't territory based. It was, vi was virtual. So you don't need to be anywhere. You just need to be in specific rules. So these three years were very important. And in another six years, we actually did APO on New York Stock Exchange and put Belarusian flag next to American. And how it did happen? So EPAM is an ecosystem company. What it does mean? We talking today, we're building like a lot of solutions for big companies, where hundreds or sometimes five, six hundred engineers need to work on big platform for the clients on data platform, e-commerce platform, doing consulting, like we need to grow 20% per year. So, and for this, to bring value to the client, we need to become ecosystem ourselves, which means that we need to be innovation company and consulting company and 
focus of next couple of minutes will be on educational and community company and social responsibility company and at the same time being the best engineering company in the services market. So first of all, 15 years ago we started our internal training programs. We established special group inside of the company which nothing new for this. At the same time we started to work with universities. We're working today with uh, 40 universities across uh, former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. We train since 2004 30,000 people. 13, from 30,000, 13,000 we were actually hired. Just last year we trained 8,000 people and 3,000 came to EPA. We also opened boot camping company in cooperation in High Tech Park and last year it was enrolled 3,000 people. So we understand what's happening hands-on from our clients. We bring in this to educational process. Uh, we extend this to kids like last year almost 4,000 kids were trained in our camps. So we also think about it. We have about five, six hundred large global companies, our clients. They come in all the time to our locations, like in any locations, Kiev, Minsk, like four or five visitors visiting us at the time. At the same time, hundreds of our people seeing in first hand how US works or how Western Europe works or how Singapore works. And we create an international assignment programs where we rotate people to understand what's happening globally. So we're kind of shrinking the globe very, very fast with this. Uh, oops, sorry. So in general, we have half of thousand people working in the farm and education full time including language school and technology school. Sorry, it's like direction. So also is an experiment because we train our people how to do enterprise scale development on very high level. We just established in Ukraine master degree program in software engineering in partnership with National University of Kyiv Mahila Academy as an experiment. We bring in how we teach in us internally to external market. And we're thinking that if it's successful, this is two years program, we will scale it to thousand people across regions where we operate. Uh, community equal competency. We know that we need to grow. We bring in a lot of people together. We run in about thousand events per year with 10,000 IPAM contributors and 30,000 external contributors. 300 communities we kind of moderating in regions where we operate. And hackathons and meetups and massive of different events. So I'm focusing only on one aspect of this, how to scale, but at the same time, I think the most important piece for everybody here, it's not about where headquarters happen, it's actually where people stay and where they live. Because if we're creating high paid jobs in the market, then it's create economy around them. And that's what about it, and that's why we're focusing here about education and communities. But on another side, all this help IPAM to become one of the top 10 largest global digital transformational companies in line with, in the same list with Accenture and Capgemini and IBM and Deloitte Digital. This is Forrester report three months ago. And we become one of the top global agencies, creative agencies globally as well. So we're not just engineers anymore. And this is means that we are attracting very different type of jobs across our locations. And think about business analysts and uh, project managers. It's not even, you have to be just software engineer. It's a lot of different uh, focuses. And very important to show that we keep in our engineering focus. This is a list of largest contributors to open source and the palm among top 20 companies globally and on this list there is no any other services companies. There is no Accenture, there is no Deloitte, there is no Indian companies. It's only top 
companies like Google, Microsoft, IBM, and IPAM, one of the top 20 global. So which means that we have found how to actually train very, very good engineers. So with this, we, from 2013, each year on the 25 fastest growing publicly traded companies list, and there are only other three companies which were on this list each year, which is Facebook, Google, and Fortinet, plus us. And we just got on the list of fastest growing Fortune 100 companies globally in 2019, second time. And since IPO, we increase our shareholders value 15 times. And that's how we're looking for the next couple of years, how to create this ecosystem stronger. So this is like any modern company, we have very robust digital ecosystem which we build to run, train, evaluate people. We also have an advantage to understand how the best in the world is doing this because most of them are our clients. This is just a screenshot from our internal system where you see employees, 70,000, which means our current and former employees, and about a million people who were candidates at EPAM. This is potentially very interesting ecosystem. That's why we come in with a program called Work and Learn Anywhere, where we were going to extend EPAM connections practically to each relatively big city across the regions we operate and beyond that. We are going to open operation in three, five countries, new countries in the region just next year. And create about 15,000 new jobs by 2021. So ecosystem impact, I think that's what we focusing on. And I think, uh, yes, this is back how it's all create and change the environment. Arkady, thank you. You have just told a remarkable story. And uh, EPAM uh, is clearly a model for, uh, in response to the, the fundamental question we're asking today uh, about how to build the new economy. You have figured out how to do it with EPAM. Um, and essentially, you've said that uh, uh, you made a virtue out of a necessity. You were obligated, given the uh, territory in which you were working, um, uh, to try to uh, build an ecosystem that answered those fundamental challenges that, uh, that you faced at the beginning. Where do you get the talent? What about the legislative environment? And what about the fundamental question of uh, perception? Why would we be uh, doing this with Ukrainians, with Belarusians, with others? Um, and my question to you will be, I'd like you to think about it and, and uh, others as well, is what would need to change for uh, the next EPAM, another, uh, uh, something similar to EPAM, to emerge out of an apartment and a kitchen and a bedroom in New Jersey, but uh, somewhere in, uh, in Minsk or somewhere in Kiev or somewhere in Tashkent. Uh, what are the impediments uh, to answering that first fundamental question that, uh, that you ask, you know, why why did we start this in the United States? Why can't we start it uh, right here in the Eurasia region? And so I'll, I'll be interested in, in coming back to that. Um, and also to the broader point, uh, I, uh, I hope that we can uh, ventilate some of uh, the, the point you made towards the end, is that uh, it does not depend on geography it depend to, to build this kind of successful uh, model. It depends on the rules. And where are people living who actually do the building, uh, the engineering, the, the roots of which EPAM has uh, stuck with all these years? So I'd like to come back to those themes that you've introduced uh, as we continue our discussion. Uh, now uh, I'd like uh, Dmitry Bogov to uh, make some opening comments. Thank you, Horton. These are all fascinating stories, uh, what we heard uh, now about uh, EPAM uh, in the previous session about uh, Encata, Thinkwheel, and uh, these are driving the uh, 
uh, economies, the new economies uh, in the region. And uh, this is the only way how to uh, fully benefit, uh, to bear the fruits uh, from this new economy. But the issue is uh, that these are isolated uh, cases. So the key here, the key question is how to create environment where this will be just a, a normal uh, uh, way of doing, the, of doing business and just uh, business as usual, to have many such companies. And only in that case, uh, we would have uh, Eurasia to bear the full benefits uh, from new economy. And when we are talking about new economy, this is not a new issue. I mean, first time the term new economy was uh, launched uh, in, uh, back in uh, 83 by the cover article of Time magazine when they were uh, speaking about the new economy. And at that time, they understood that this uh, moving uh, from heavy industry to an economy based on new technology. And, uh, okay, the term evolved during the time, uh, understanding evolved, but basically it's still uh, this is the case. Uh, now we have also synonyms of, uh, synonyms of uh, new economy, digital economy, knowledge economy. And uh, when we talk about this knowledge economy, digital economy, uh, we understand uh, to have production of goods and services uh, that will be based on knowledge-intensive activities. So the key here is knowledge. Uh, everything is around the knowledge. And uh, in order to be able to benefit from the new digital economy, we need to uh, tackle this issue, knowledge, how to create more knowledge uh, in uh, this uh, region. Because new economy presents a new opportunity for development. Uh, but the countries have to be able to seize these uh, opportunities. And challenges are high. Uh, just for illustration, uh, uh, McKinsey Global Institute estimates that by 2030, 14% of all global force, which is close to 400 million uh, workers, will have to find new occupations. And this is uh, something in line that uh, Prasanna was uh, talking uh, yesterday about. Our Bloomberg uh, study finds that 10% of workforce in 2030 will be in occupations that does not exist today. If we talk about the kids that are entering the school uh, today, uh, probably after 20 years when they enter the labor force, this percentage is even higher, 20, 30%. So the question is whether we are preparing these kids uh, on the right way in the education to be able to work in this new environment, to work on these new occupations that we don't know how they will look like today. So the key is here to create an educational system, and not just educational system, ed education is the key, but we need, uh, as the others were speaking, about the whole environment, uh, uh, ecosystem that will uh, promote uh, such uh, skills that would... Uh, uh, be needed in the past and uh, our economies would benefit uh, f from this. So uh, if we don't know now how these uh, working places uh, will look like, uh, then we need to create uh, some uh, flexible uh, uh, skills uh, in the uh, uh, new workforce. So uh, critical thinking, uh, uh, creativity, and uh, digital uh, knowledge. These are uh, the elements that certainly would be required uh, in the uh, future, uh, after t 10, 20, 30 years. So uh, how to prepare our countries for this? Because uh, countries uh, who, who uh, uh, rely on uh, routine jobs and uh, they have very small share of university-educated population face the highest risk uh, in this uh, evolving uh, new economy. I would say that even university education is not a guarantee that uh, people will be employable. Uh, again, Prasanna was uh, speaking yesterday how, how, uh, how much of uh, today occupations would be automated in the future. So uh, we need to choose uh, the right uh, uh, high education, the right uh, skills uh, uh, to offer to uh, today's uh, kids in order to be able to drive our economies uh, in the period uh, to come. Uh, certainly STEM education is uh, something that will be required uh, still in the future. But uh, again, I will say uh, 
creative thinking, uh, critical thinking. These are uh, skills that need to be part of the regular curriculum. And uh, let, let's see how, how the, uh, our region, which is strategy, uh, East, strategy East region, uh, feature in this. Uh, I've, I, uh, EBRD this year developed uh, one uh, so-called knowledge uh, index, knowledge economy index, and this is based on four pillars. Uh, institutions for innovation, skills for innovation, then innovation system, and ICT infrastructure. And if we take uh, this strategist uh, focus region, these 14 uh, countries, then uh, we can see, okay, the, 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 the measure here is from one to 10, 10 being the highest value. Uh, Baltic states uh, are certainly on the top of the list, and we calculated this index for uh, 38 countries, uh, which are countries of uh, operation for EBRD. So Baltic states are on the top of this list, and they have uh, uh, a score of 7 to 8. Then uh, the uh, six countries of... Um, uh, Eastern and Eastern Europe and Caucasus, uh, they score significantly lower, I, with the exception of Belarus, which is on 11th place. Uh, all uh, the others are uh, with score between four and five, and they are uh, in the second half of this list of 38 countries. And if we move further to Central Asia countries, then uh, they are all on the bottom of the list of 38 countries where EBRD operates, and the scores are between two and four. So this is significantly uh, low, uh, significantly low scores for these countries, just uh, in comparison within EBRD, EBRD countries, which are not uh, the best uh, in the world. Uh, if we compare with uh, developed economies, then uh, this region is, uh, I mean, EBRD countries of operations are far lagging uh, behind. So uh, we need uh, to focus on these issues. Uh, institutions for innovation, uh, uh, our, our region, uh, with the exception of Baltic, is featuring very low. Also in innovation systems. So institutions for innovation, this means level playing field, good governance, good systems of protection of property rights, then innovation system, how, we are, how much we are uh, uh, investing in uh, innovation, uh, what is the uh, ecosystem uh, to enable uh, investment in R&D. Uh, again, very weak uh, scoring. Skills for innovation, I ICT infrastructure, the scores are a bit, are a bit uh, better, but still, do we have enough skills? If you look uh, at the uh, export of services of uh, countries just of Eastern Europe and Caucasus, they are growing every year by 20 to 30 percent. So it's significant, but from very low base, with the exception of Belarus. All the others are growing from very low base. And the question is, can this be sustained in the future? Probably at one point of time, very soon it will be exhausted. And in order to extend uh, uh, these uh, high growth rates, we need to invest in these skills, in knowledge, in the whole ecosystem. So gover government, government uh, probably can do a lot, but uh, again, we have to be careful here. Uh, government can also kill the environment for uh, businesses. And if we look in the past, governments uh, could very easily uh, have as it was mentioned in the previous session, rent-seeking behavior on the businesses, and businesses were physically located in the country, they could hardly move, and they didn't have choice. But with this uh, new economy businesses, they have choice. If they, there is rent-seeking behavior, they will move abroad and they will never come back here. So we need to maybe be in inventive and innovative in this uh, uh, area. So maybe there could be uh, private public partnership uh, 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 schemes that would, uh, good, uh, that, that would work well. I was uh, inspired by uh, Think Will, uh, by Anna, who was, who was speaking uh, about uh, education, starting uh, digital education from kindergarten. And yes, uh, if we s see that there are many private companies doing this in digital area, why not uh, government to make this public good and just to finance it? 
So it's not that government has to provide education, but government needs to finance in order to have broader uh, uh, coverage of this education. But let allow if there are successful examples, and this is a sphere where we already see very inventive and very innovative thinking. Let's just build uh, on it. Thanks, I will stop here. Dimitar, thank you very much for that. You uh, laying out the knowledge economy index uh, and the different uh, vertices of it um, is, uh, is very helpful. One thing that uh, you point out, as I think just about everyone on the panel so far, is that uh, for one reason or another, the Baltic nations uh, have emerged as leaders um, in, this, uh, in the new economy. And uh, it's a bit like um, uh, a recipe for cooking something. We know basically what the elements are that go into something, uh, go into the successful combination of uh, the uh, different dimensions of the new economy. But in what measure and uh, in what uh, sequence? And I'd like to make sure we come back to the, to the fundamental question of uh, when we're, whether we're talking about finding and training talent, as uh, has been mentioned, um, uh, whether we're talking about uh, the need for companies to move uh, on their own or, uh, and in spite of the obstacles and the environment in which they find themselves, or in collaboration with those who are changing the environment uh, in which they operate. Um, this is a question that you can come down on either side, uh, depending on whether you're uh, in the private sector or in the public sector. And our goal is to see uh, what are the opportunities for either collaboration or separation and division of effort uh, to achieve the goals that have been uh, discussed. Now I'd like to turn to Martin uh, for our last opening comment, and you have slides as well. Thank you very much, um, Horton. I'm, I'm just going to see... Good. Um, just say thank you very much for the invitation here and um, how inspiring I find it is to be on this panel and, and I always learn things on from panels such as this which I can uh, take home and inject into the policy making, so thank you for that. I thought it would be important to set out the European perspective, the EU perspective, which um, as, as you know, we, the, the Eastern Partnership countries have a closer and a closer relationship with, with the European Union. As Horton said, I'm head of unit for digital policy and not the best clicker in the world. There. Nope. Hold on a minute. Ah, there we go. Okay. Ah, it's, this is tricky. Ah, there we go. It's the bottom. It's in the reverse. That's the story of my life. Um, so I thought I would set out here um, some of the fundamental building blocks of the EU approach um, that sets out how we provide stability, predictability, and where possible, uniformity of approach. These are not only the essence of the single market in Europe, but this is also the essence of building a strong investment and predictable climate um, which many countries in the world are struggling uh, to build, including the Eastern Partnership countries. And that must not be uh, underestimated. Um, I'm just going to take one issue with one point that um, Dimitar uh, mentioned with McKinsey. And uh, we're working with McKinsey on a study. So hopefully you'll see different findings uh, when we've inputted on this. It's not the jobs that will go. And I think this is a misconception by McKinsey here. It's the tasks that will change. It's not that the jobs will suddenly disappear tomorrow. This is simply not true. A lorry driver, there are many exaggerations about artificial intelligence made by people who know nothing about artificial intelligence. We are a long way from replacing a lorry driver uh, with artificial intelligence. And to drive a lorry out of Kiev uh, in, in, on a very busy day with a lot of congestion, that will still be done by a human being for a long time to come. What may change is that the automated transport along the, along the motorway may be done remotely by like a drone operator and the expert lorry driver can maybe drive four or five of these. The same way, we are not going to replace a doctor 
by supervised learning. We used supervised learning to look at histology samples because artificial intelligence can simply better identify the presence of tumors uh, in, in histologies than the human eye. But it cannot do the job of the doctor in analyzing the findings of the, uh, um, of the histology, explaining it to the patient, and having that human part. So I would, I would dispute McKinsey, McKinsey findings there, and I will be uh, reinforcing that in the next days. In fact, I speak to them this afternoon. Um, and in fact, uh, Andrew Ng, who, was, who is a, a professor at, at MIT, and he was also at Google Brain and at Baidu, Amongst his friends, he, he come, tries to come up with professions that cannot be replaced by technology. And they come up with a the hairdresser. There's also the gardener. There's also the, um, the plumber. Now, technology may enhance this, but when we see a complete, because we are a long way from achieving the dexterity that's required from a gardener and a plumber a hairdresser. So I just wanted to put, put that slight, slight myth away and there are many, many technology experts and professors who would uh, agree with these findings. It's the tasks that will change. That some jobs may disappear, but we, it's the relationship between man and machine that is going to evolve in, in the next minute. So I'll, I'll have a go at McKinsey this afternoon. Um, so what I want to talk about is this, is this EU approach. We launched the digital single market back in 2015. It was a big priority for President Juncker. I'm not going to go through every step, but you'll see there are three building blocks you can read for yourselves. They're built on better access to digital products and services for uh, businesses and consumers. There's a digital environment. This is a predictable and stable environment, a regulatory environment. This is essential. And for me, what is perhaps the most important part is building the digital economy. If you do not have one and two, you cannot have three. If you do not have access, if you do not have the framework, then you cannot have the, the, all the benefits that, that come out from the digital economy. I'm going to move to quickly to my next slide. Um, there have been 30 legislative proposals uh, in the last four or five years. I've worked on uh, two or three of them myself. Um, it's not just legislative, but we have now passed 28 out of 30. So they've been adopted by um, the European Parliament and the European Council. This is something of a record. You may recognize some of these uh, pieces of, of law. I worked on geoblocking and also on, on platforms. We were the first regulatory authority uh, in the world to begin to regulate uh, the relationship between online platforms and businesses. So trying to create more fairness uh, in the world of platforms um, on all online platforms. It's not just Google and Facebook and Amazon, uh, the gaffers. Um, and we'll be proceeding with more legislation in the next months. You probably don't know what on earth AVMSD is. It's the Audiovisual Media and Services Directive. There, we try to limit or ban harmful content. So all these nasty videos and video, video footage you may see online, this is banned under the, under, the AVMS, under the AVMSD. More of this anon if you wish. Um, I'm going down, ah, there we go. Just to say it's not all legislative proposals. Um, there are certain measures um, which, which, which are either non-binding or, or, or simply initiatives and policies. This mostly reflects the, f the differences in, in competence. The European Union has exclusive legal competence in certain areas, for example, in telecommunications, for example, in competition law, but it doesn't in others. This is where the government has the competence, particularly in areas like uh, defense, so cybersecurity, uh, and, uh, and skills, and, uh, and then, of course, industrial policy. I haven't added to this, far, to this slide, but a very important part of EU policy is the funding. So the Horizon Europe program, the old H2020, uh, which provided massive amounts of funding for research in ICT and other areas, and our proposed Digital Europe program, which is about deployment, where we're actually going to buy, for example, the fastest supercomputers in the world, we'll put money into artificial intelligence, we'll put money into cybersecurity. That's 10 billion euros, which isn't much, but let's say it's, it's a start. Um, I'm going to just jump ahead because I prepared more slides and for time. 
Europe is not without its challenges. And I think the first one of these about a divided, uh, a divided Europe, and of course there's that we have the political populism, um, which has been exacerbated hugely uh, by social media, we cannot deny this. But also the economic disparities. And I was comforted to hear the, the, the deputy minister say um, that they're having a broadband plan for the whole of, uh, of, of Ukraine. This is vitally important because not only does technology provide opportunities, but it can also increase the disparities and the differences. So if you have fantastic internet coverage in Kiev and you have poor internet coverage in Mariupol, this can affect the delivery of services which directly uh, affect the, the bodies, the physical bodies of citizens. I'm giving, for the example, in e-health. In, in Madrid in Spain, they provide uh, a particular service for stroke victims where the ambulance personnel, when they arrive at the scene and somebody has had a stroke, the, the uh, ambulance staff can speak directly to the hospital, to the practitioner, the expert in strokes. Why? because the first 13 minutes of a stroke are absolutely critical. It's between life and death, and also uh, the risk of, 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 of becoming handicapped mentally or physically. Now, if you can imagine, if that service is available only in Kiev, and not in Bukovel or Mariupol, you will then create a massive disparity in the quality and delivery of health care, not just gaming or other service, but can really make differences in people's lives. It's not just, just, just economic. Um, you can read for yourselves uh, in, on, on the slide there. We have our own uh, problems and, and tensions and challenges in Europe, and of course, we are trying to catch up in many areas. Uh, with, with the US and, and, and China, and you can see the amounts invested in those countries. Clearly in China, the state is investing vast amounts in new technologies, let's say developing technologies such as artificial intelligence. Earlier this year, China, uh, the state invested 300 billion euros in one, in one SME, in one small company for artificial technology. That's a, s oops, I'm going the right way again. Oh, yeah. That's a slide, so you see uh, where the European Union um, sits with, with uh, internationally. You can see there's a difference between the top of the EU, right at the top, and the, and, and the middle, the EU average, and at the bottom. This is the DESI. We, we provide an index. Uh, it's a digital economic and societal index. Um, we do this every year, and we compare countries across the European Union, and we also compare our performance according to certain criteria uh, with, with the rest of the world. Um, jumping ahead, you may or may not know that we have a new, we're forming a new commission. This is our commission president, uh, von der Leyen, and like President Juncker, she has made digital a priority. Her priority is called a Europe fit for the digital age. I'm going to focus on some of the um, initiative which have been announced. One of them is action on artificial intelligence. This will likely lead to legislation, probably uh, a softer approach to, to uh, legislation at the beginning, but we are almost certain to come out with legislation and be the first uh, to legislate um, across the world on this. We will come out with a new Digital Services Act, and this essential, essentially will focus on other online harms that are not picked, picked up by existing legislation, whether it's the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, the e-commerce directive, uh, or the Audiovisual Services and Media Directive. Sorry to be very particular on this, I also teach um, at the University of, of, of Bruges, the College of Europe, digital, digital law. So I'm just homing in on a few of these key aspects. We'll also be doing policy on education and um, uh, advancing much further on cybersecurity. I'll let you look at that, those slides um, at, your, at your leisure. So now to turn where we are um, geographically in, in the area. Um, as I hinted at at the beginning, um, I think it's critically important for Ukraine to have a stable legal and regulatory framework. And that doesn't mean just adopting the laws. It means having a stable and independent regulator that is free of influence 
uh, political, financial, or otherwise. And that perhaps is one of the reasons, um, and, 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 and I quote um, the, 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 the founder of Skype and the founder of, um, of, of TransferWise, who said that it's okay to which um, Dimitro referred, it's not good enough just to have a tech park. A tech park cannot exist in a vacuum. It's great to provide a spark for creativity and innovation, but you have to have the stable, legal, and predictable framework for these tech parks, and it may be a reason, this is personal opinion, for those tech parks, for the innovations that, that Arcadia, and to have more of Arcadia's company, for these to take off, you must have the stable, regulated, and political framework. It's unfortunate the deputy minister isn't, isn't here to listen to this, but we will be telling the Ukrainian authorities these in, in the next days. The essence of a regulator, of a stable and predictable regulator, is, is the bedrock of trust which investors need, and I cannot say that, I cannot say that enough. On the very positive note, the EU is doing a lot. It's always about reading the fine print. It's a very boring thing to do, read all our documents. But there's a lot in the fine print. If you read the mission letters of the commission designate, if you read the commission designate for enlargement, there's some very encouraging news for the Eastern Partnership. And I quote a little bit there in the square box. One is strengthening relations with the Eastern Partnership in all areas, including the digital economy. The second is accelerating the implementation of the association agreements. There are currently three, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. They are also contain uh, DCFTs, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreements. And so there's a very clear mandate to advance on this. These mandate letters were written at the very top of the European Commission with full political support. And once that mandate is given to officials like me, we have to go ahead and we have to push ahead. And we have to make this, we have to make this work. Ukraine is in the fortunate position as well to have its own support group. And I always tell this when, I, when the Ukrainian authorities say, please do more for us. We say, well, not only is there that physical uh, and logistical support, but you also have your own support group. Just flipping to the, to the other side of, of that slide, there's also political buy-in, there's a political cooperation. There has been three ministerial meetings with the Eastern Partnership, the last one in, in Brussels in 2016, where they launched EU for Digital. EU for Digital is essentially, not only provides funding, but it provides a vehicle to uh, support, support the implementation chiefly of, of digital roadmaps and focus on, on various rules. Now, just a little bit about my, my day job. I mean, I came into um, to work uh, on, on, on the Ukraine, and I, I see that my colleague uh, Svetlana is, is sitting here in the audience with whom um, we're working closely with the EU delegation. My main job is on the digital single market, and I started to work on the portfolio of Ukraine. Um, what we are actually physically, mentally doing now is making sure that the association agreement with Ukraine, the all-important Annex 17, which is very boring, and very technical, but it's very, very concrete indeed. We are working ensuring that there is alignment between the EU rules and the Ukrainian rules in the area of telecommunications. And on the basis of that alignment, there is an independent and fully functioning regulator in Ukraine. If we manage to achieve this step, I believe this will make a phenomenal leap forward for Ukraine in providing the stable legislative and regulatory and political framework that it needs uh, for, for investments to, to take off. Um, I think I've probably uh, said enough there, but I would also speak just on one more thing that, that Arkady mentioned, this, this importance of, of, of project management, that not only do you need the nerds and the geeks and the political support, you need the leadership you need the project managers who can take things from the words, who can take the ideas and turn them into a very successful project. And I hope there will be many much more in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. <clears throat> so we have, uh, we, we began uh, the panel with, uh, with Alex uh, laying out uh, an extraordinarily ambitious goal for Ukraine, 100% access to broadband. And Martin um, uh, described what essentially in, in his brief is uh, handling 
the fundamental question of how do you achieve region-wide goals while at the same time drawing out the strengths of the individual countries and, and uh, members in the EU. Um, to what extent is there an overarching policy solution to the challenges that have been laid out? And to what extent do we need to look at uh, individual or corporate private sector initiative? So let's start with, uh, in the time that we have remaining, uh, this issue of access. And I'd like to hear uh, uh, from both from uh, Dimitro and uh, Arkady, um, our non-governmental folks here at the table. Um, what do we do about uh, including those who are left out? To what extent do you, as practitioners, um, look to uh, government action to broaden the access that uh, citizens have to the new economy, to the digital economy, and to what extent are you prepared to uh, operate in spite of government action? So would you like to start on that one, Mitra? Well, um, uh, Google in Ukraine has a very concrete example of uh, what, you, what you're talking about. So we have an initiative called Digital Transformation of Ukrainian Regions, which uh, is running up for like, I think, four years already. We just take one region by one and um, working with local um, policymakers, with local governments and with local civil society activists uh, on actually educating them of benefits of being digital, having proper access and um, actually using benefits of internet uh, outside of just entertainment. And um, main actually our main goal for this was to showcase, to demonstrate what kind of things can be achieved, how local economies may, in a decentralized way, may uh, actually benefit from adopting more technologies around themselves. Uh, I think it worked pretty well. We didn't do uh, all regions of Ukraine. We roughly made like half of Ukrainian oblasts, as we call them, here. and. Uh, we, at some point, we had a line of other regions that were not included in the initial program. Please come and do it for us. Which we honestly replied that our role is not really doing this. Our role was to show you how it works mm -hmm. and empower you with tools, not necessarily only Google tools, because we had situations when we demonstrated something based on Google and the region uh, go on and actually uh, implemented it with Microsoft help at some point. It's fine. Um, for us, it was, uh, we said that for us, it's mostly uh, important to show how it works, to show the benefits, and to give people the ability to take it and actually uh, um, establish it by themselves without any help from either government or us. I think it's working pretty well for now. And Ukraine, for, for, for us, for Google, it's a very important and very successful project so far. So this is it, but we think that more importantly, it's not some, somebody who should go ahead and do it in terms of is it corporate, corporate corporations or local governments. We believe in civil society. And uh, being part of civil society with, with tools that actually can generate actions like this. That's our view on the situation. And are there any uh, aspects of this proof of concept that, uh, that go beyond uh, civil society initiative? Are there impediments that, um, as, you, uh, as you did your debrief on the initiative, uh, whereby there were uh, any actions or absence of actions by the government that you would you feel would be more successful in a future test. Um, uh, from from our practical experience, we we believe that actually local governments did almost exactly the the, the things we wanted from them. They were not, not they were very supportive in many cases, most cases. Uh, our experience says that the least uh, known the region is the least uh, GDP generating the region is, the more enthusiasm was coming from government to do something about it. Um, I'm not sure actually that I can give you a good example of either support or absence of support here. It was pretty well working for me. I was a little bit even more surprised with the level of enthusiasm and support we got from government in the situations. I think that uh, people just started to realize that it's important, regardless of where they're based and what kind of job they do. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to turn to Arkady now uh, with uh, the same fundamental question about uh, 
uh, is where is the where's the boundary between uh, private and public action in uh, aiming to achieve these uh, ex the ambitious 100 uh, percent penetration of uh, of uh, the digital economy? And if you would uh, add to that, Arkady, um, with uh, reflecting on your experience um, in solving it yourself by the creation of your own ecosystem to get access to talent to then translate and adapt that talent to uh, the needs that your company was uh, fulfilling for clients. Um, where do you see the dividing line and do you feel that uh, if you had lived, uh, if, if EPAM had emerged in an ideal legislative and regulatory envi environment, you would have done it the same way? You would have done a thousand events a year, is that something intrinsic to your success or was that making a virtue of necessity? Uh, <clears throat> I guess we all understand how difficult these questions and how all these answers is uh, sometimes not helpful. Uh, because like uh, also saying like what would happen if high-tech park in Belarus never would be established. Would it come today here or not? And I still don't have an answer. It definitely, there is an answer that it did happen, and IPAM happened, and a lot of other IT companies because of this happened in Belarus. But what would be without it? How worse? We don't know. Like, I think uh, from, we, like, I can, kind of have a benefit of the story of 25 years to tell and refer. And from this story, what was happening in Belarus, for example, when they introduced 1% tax on the revenue instead of everything else. What it gave to us is the flexibility to utilize funds the way how we think they should be utilized. Instead of forcing to put millions and millions of dollars in existing government-driven educational system, we actually put millions and millions of dollars where we thought it makes sense. Having direct, if you think, neural connection to the clients and to external world, which was like in real time navigating and directing us what to do. Instead of going to three, five, 10 years plan, and trying to predict something and establish all these programs and then wasting money for another 20 years. I think that did work pretty well from this point of view, okay? So at the same time, when I'm thinking, okay, let's give all education to private hands and then I'm remembering growing up in Soviet Union. <laughs> and now, 30, 40 years later, thinking that it actually was pretty good educational system, completely government run. So that's why I don't know the answers. You guys, like, on another side of the equation, should have more <laughs> knowledge how to do it better. Uh, but I think the right, the right partnership should be there. And I think we're augmenting what basic should be established by government, and then I think the rules should be established, and we talked on previous panel. I think that's the main point. It should be the rules, and rules should be equal for everybody, okay? Because like, to go in some of the countries we're talking about it, like most of them allow you to create private school for kids or private universities. In reality, some people can do it if they have connection, and some don't. And that's the main problem, which actually limiting the market right away. So I think if private schools and private universities would be easily created, or at least not easily, I understand there is certification, there is assessment, all of this, but the same rule would be, I think it would be great, great deal. But then we're talking about different topics which people discussing today, corruption and all of this other stuff, which is always the limit. Thank you, Arkady. The, uh so it, it does come down to uh, the rules and equal playing field. And I think the example of your company um, is an extraordinary testament to that. That um, yes, you uh, incorporated in the United States um, because uh, the rules were more conducive there for a variety of reasons. 
Uh, but when you look at the workforce and the proportion of the market that you've been able to, uh, to capture um, in this part of the world, uh, the results speak for themselves. That, uh, that if you provide uh, or offer um, an equal opportunity for employment based on intellect rather than, say, uh, proximity to power, um, you get uh, a kind of company like uh, EPEM. I think I, I, I would comment about headquarters and all of this because I a little bit comment about it. We incorporated in the U.S. Yes, kind of partially accidentally because I immigrated to U.S. and that's where I started. But at the same time, I'm hearing so many talks about let's create startup economy, let's create this and that and this. And I think headquarters will be still moving to the countries where the market is. And until there is no market in Belarus, Ukraine, or Georgia, or Armenia, headquarters not going to happen there. But if we create the environment with people like Belarus, like somebody you mentioned that Belarus is pretty high in the rating, because Belarus established the high tech park almost 15 years ago, because for this time industry is pretty big and driving, and this creates an environment around them, like it's very different country or at least cities than it was like 15, 20 years ago. And I am there each month while I'm living in the U.S. and I'm seeing there how changes quickly was happening. And in Belarus, you can go on the street and people will speak English to you easily, which wasn't impossible 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. So, but headquarters still not going to be there until... And I think the hope that we establish this is product economy or services economy or whatever. And Google, it's a subsidiary of Google, which is in the U.S. So just not to be a little bit naive about it. So while we're uh, anticipating the, the emergence of markets that uh, are scaled to such an extent that uh, these headquarters may migrate uh, further to the east, um, you mentioned, uh, Arkady, um, the dichotomy between, say, public and private education, the uh, uh, assessing the relative value uh, of uh, public versus private initiative in this area and how it translates into opportunity. Um, I'd like to turn to Dimitar now uh, because he mentioned uh, the, uh, the, in, in his uh, knowledge uh, index the, um, uh, the essential, uh, the necessity for uh, bringing new talent in to the digital economy uh, at an early stage. And indeed, you mentioned the idea of public-private partnerships. And so whether we're talking about the identification or cultivation of talent, or whether we're talking about the application of uh, the knowledge that uh, you assert is so essential to success in the uh, digital economy, uh, how would you come down on this question of where does, uh, where does collective and political and government action end, and where does private initiative start? Certainly there should be a combination of uh, both uh, sides because uh, we cannot exclude uh, anyone. Uh, government will continue to be crucial in the education and it cannot be replaced. But certainly it could be amended by some successful examples. And I was uh, uh, stimulated by what Anna uh, spoke about, uh, which was very successful case. I mean... Uh, Obviously, government was not present, it's not present yet in uh, early digital education of the uh, school kids. And the private sector already started some initiative. So why not to support this initiative and why this initiative not to grow with government support, but government support not meddling into this process, but just improving it and supporting it financially. Because uh, at the end, this, this should be government goal, to introduce digital education from the early age. It's not just a matter of uh, getting the benefits of the new digital economy, but it will be a matter of uh, surviving after 20, 30 years. Uh, economy is evolving in that direction, and those who don't have such digital skills we will have difficulties on the personal level to live into such uh, environment where we will have Internet of Things and everything will be digital 
So those who will not have digital education after 20 years will feel the same like uh, at the beginning of 20th century, those who were illiterate. And uh, also on the level of the governments, governments who don't have uh, countries, countries who don't have uh, people digitally educated, they would uh, be pushed uh, to uh, lower value uh, edit uh, uh, jobs and industries. And there will be clear division. And uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, many low end and high end jobs in the future will remain. They will remain forever. But many jobs we are witnessing now in the middle are already disappearing. When you go to the airport, you check in by yourself. So many clerks lost jobs. When you go to the bank, you actually you don't go to the bank. <laughs> you're making payments online. You're uh, taking money in the ATM. So many clerks lost jobs. So many jobs in the middle are already lost. Uh, when last time you booked a holiday through travel agent? You book by yourself through booking, through Airbnb. So this is uh, a division to low end and high end uh, jobs. And uh, we don't want our countries to uh, remain uh, those that will provide uh, low end uh, uh, jobs and, low, uh, and provide workforce for low end uh, industries. And that's why it's important government to take initiative into improving the general ecosystem for new economy, for digital economy, and education is certainly one of the key aspects of it, but not just uh, education, governance. Governance is uh, on the first place because we are talking about a region which is not, uh, um, uh, which is not uh, scoring uh, very well on uh, governance issues. So rule of law, good governance, good institutions, and uh, just uh, to promote our transition report, which will be uh, launched uh, next week, uh, uh, I, I, my colleagues did one exercise uh, where they estimated what would be the governance dividend. So improving the governance in uh, all these countries of operations, but there was also example of Ukraine, which I will mention. If Ukraine improves governance, just half, it, if, if it covers just half of the gap to the G7 economies in the next 10 years, it will add 1.2% uh, on the GDP growth, which is substantial and which shows what is the power of governance. And this is just the direct influence, but indirect, much bigger because better governance would create better environment for uh, this flourishing new industries and all this will multiply the, uh, the growth potential. Thank you, Dimitar. Uh, Alex, while you were away, we um, have come up with a formula for achieving 100% broadband <laughs> and digital economy participation, which uh, we'll tell you after the panel. Uh, let, let's, uh, as we draw to a close, I, I want to come back to, uh, uh, to policy, to, uh, to Martin, and then uh, Alex will give you a last word. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, after your remarks, uh, in a way, uh, Martin, you, you are faced with, uh, with, with a challenge that encompasses everything we're addressing here. Um, how do you uh, think big? and region-wide and inter-regionally uh, to level the playing field, to set the, uh, uh, the environment uh, for uh, the achievement of our digital economic goals, um, while at the same time taking into account the idiosyncrasies and the particularities of the different jurisdictions, uh, sub-jurisdictions in which you operate. And so I'd like you to think about uh, where you ended your remarks uh, about uh, Ukraine, Eurasia, um, and can you give us an example of, uh, of a policy innovation or policy activity uh, that you've seen has had a uh, measurable effect on addressing that uh, digital divide? Um, that's the, the, the last one is very, very difficult to answer, uh, Horton. Um, just to 
to, to recap on a few things, I think so for the region, clearly, and I think all the speakers here uh, to my left emphasize the high level of, of STEM skill that you have. So balancing between the Soviet style system and then the new modern uh, Eastern European education, very, very strong in STEM sciences, which actually is weaker, but then you, which was open to the public. And then you contrast that with, with the US that has possibly the, 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 the best excellence in the world with Oxford and Cambridge. I know that Oxford uh, two years in a row has won best university in the world, but where we can really attract those experts, and many of those experts come from uh, former Soviet Union countries. So there's a very strong basis in that. Um, making this possible and, and, the, and the challenge, I mean, talking a little bit more again of, of, of my daily work, um, of making the, the association agreement, uh, making making that implementable and making that implemented, which is, which is an, an enormous challenge. Um, and I think what this requires is not only, and this mustn't be underestimated, um, ensuring that the letter of the law is implemented and applied, and this is critical for the, in, for the investors and for the, the, the Arcades who are immensely successful uh, entrepreneurs. Um, it's also important, as I said, to having the independent regulator um, because without the independent reg regulator, you miss that vital element of trust from international communities. This is hugely missing at the moment in Ukraine, and we're working very, very strong to make that happen. I emphasize this, and I'll emphasize this in my meetings in, uh, in the next days. But if we make that work, the leap forward for Ukraine is, is phenomenal. And I think that it takes two things which are important um, beyond the letter of the law. One is the, is the leadership, not just from the entrepreneurs, not just from the regulators, not just from the European Commission, but also the political leadership. I think the political leadership in Ukraine has to show that it believes in this process and it's committed in this process. And I think it's also important in another non-written way to create that emotional bond to say that Europe, you have made your commitments to Ukraine and the rest of the Eastern Partnership is making its commitments. But it has to create that emotional bond with the people. People have to see that there is, there is a benefit. There is a benefit to having uh, uh, good internet access in Bukovel that, or in, in Mariupol. I mentioned those two for the different sides of the country. That they can live a better life and be better connected and take advantage of the opportunities which are not, which are spared them because of the geography and the, and the idiosyncrasy. So I finish it on those two things. I think the leadership at every level, level and providing that, that uh, emotional, emotional bond. Um, I don't have a, a particular example, I'm afraid, to think of your, your very difficult question there, Horton, of, of where economic disparities have been, uh, have been reduced. But if I, if I may take the, the example of the state of Estonia, which has managed to, to mass produce a number of, of great entrepreneurs, it's also flipped the role of, of, of government, where um, the government is, is a service and not some sort of authoritarian interface. And they've come from a very difficult past. And reflipping that, that relationship between person and, and between citizen and government and business is is, I think, uh, essential, and one can see examples uh, like in, in Estonia. And there's no reason why a country like Ukraine and the Eastern Partnerships, with a level of talent and proper commitment, uh, then it cannot itself uh, um, provide uh, such examples, even to, even to the Western world, which is, which, is, uh, which is more developed at the moment. I say that again, there's no reason to prevent these countries from reaching these levels of excellence, no reason at all. That's excellent. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I'd like to, in closing, turn to Alex. And you heard Martin say that uh, really the, uh, the essential ingredient here is political will, political leadership. Um, you, by uh, the simple uh, creation of your, uh, of your ministry, this government has, uh, has explicitly uh, made that commitment. How, uh, what can you say about going uh, deeper than that broad commitment uh, to putting together these elements, uh, in particular what Martin just mentioned about how you make the, uh, the, the shift to digitization something that's not a necessity or even a burden, but uh, something that's attractive and embraced in a popular way? 
Thank, thanks for the question. And that is a great question, though. Uh, so, um, you know, I've been here less than a month at this position, I mean, uh, not in Ukraine. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's the first hard thing that I faced, that the information is so fragmented. The data that we possess is, is, is so in, not in detail, not confirmed. It, it's, it's, it's just the pieces of data that comes, comes along. And it's almost impossible to make any significant conclusion based on, 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 on some data that government has to take. It, it's, 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 his, it's, it, it's, it's responsibility to provide us with data, which, is, which they don't do. So um, that's the first thing. So um, I'm, I'm in a position now on evaluating what we have and, and then I have to make a conclusion or, or des decide which steps I have to take because uh, the quality of decision depends on that. And now the quality of decision is so poor because most people in the government, they, they make decisions based on their emotions. Th that's true. And I was, I'm, I'm, I came from business. Uh, I founded a couple IT companies and, and I, I was running them. And I, I don't remember times, it was that time when it was just, Couple of us, like Ipam mentioned, was with was small apartment that when we started. Uh, and actually, I started from outsourcing business, uh, software outsourcing business. So, but then we established a, a strong analytics team. Uh, marketing was based on, on certain research, and, and then then we do, uh, and, and then we take this information and and, and we and we make decision based on that, which government does not. Um, that, that's the that's the first hard thing, and and. Uh, it is related to political will because uh, you can certainly, certainly make commitment if you know where you are and, and, and what kind of resources you possess, but they don't know. So th it's hard to make a commitment to government to anything because they, they don't know de the details of what's going on. And um, that's, that's the first thing. Another thing that I'm, I kind of faced recently, and this, is, this sort of upsets me, um, we don't have a national idea. So, and that's, and that's the most uh, terrifying thing for me as of now. Because now we discuss, and it's, that's, that's in our title, strategy. And there is no strategy. There, there, there's basically like certain steps that we have to take. And the strategy is to increase GDP and the strategy is to create more uh, jobs, which is not strategy. And, and the national idea is completely absent. So um, I can't say that we're talent nation or startup nation as Israelis did. We can't say so. And, and because of uh, because lack of this or, or, or absence of this idea, we kind of, I don't know, we, we are everywhere. And at the same time, we're nowhere. So um, what I'm work, uh, working on, on right now is to, uh, to convince people who run this country that we need to this national idea. And this national idea, of course, because of my I know, uh, background, the nature of my business, and, 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 and the position, is, has to be related to, with the information technology and high-end expert, uh, high-end uh, I know innovations. So uh, what I'm trying to say that this all this what I, this all um, brings us to the situation where I feel the political will when I speak personally with the uh, high authorities of this country. I feel it. I can definitely say that this is the most competent government that I. Uh, soar among all of previous ones that was on like 27 uh, years uh, time frame. And they really want to change something. But um, it happens 
it what what happened where the government was really uh, I don't know um, they they unexpected it was really quick and uh, I think we need some time to show people and other countries and and, and I mean every everyone that we are committed not because because you can't meet personally everyone and 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 share your passion and show how you committed and show what you think and what you and what you're willing to do but you have to show this by by um, uh, by creating an artifacts which are which uh, are national strategies or or uh, I don't know, public uh, public documents that you you show that this, this is our priorities, this is where we're going, and this is where we aim. And since we don't have this information yet, um, I'm not sure uh, what's the what's the uh, what's the priority of, of of Ukraine right now in terms of uh, where this where this nation goes, and 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 what's the, the what's, what. What it, w where it has to be in 20 years or so. So that's, that's my perspective. Alex, thank you very much. We're uh, going to continue this conversation in our various sessions uh, this afternoon, including uh, the topics that were raised that we didn't get to, such as capitalization uh, and uh, the, what are the particular regulations and uh, operating environment that's necessary to uh, to build this new economy. Um, what I heard Alex say is two things. Uh, first of all, that there is political will to build the digital economy in Ukraine, and perhaps uh, uh, the country is best, uh, better positioned than it has been in a generation to do that. And secondly, uh, uh, inferring from what you said, uh, the policy is to understand, analyze, and actually utilize the data that we are presented in this new economy in a way that enables this country and all the nations of Eurasia to achieve their ends of development and meeting the needs of their citizens. So on that, we will close this panel, and I would like you to join me in thanking the panelists for their thoughtful comments.